All right, so um, I actually won't talk about optimality, I think, at all. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, I'll talk about uh, collective behavior mostly. Uh, and these are my heroes today, the birds, the flies, and the people who take data. And uh, Federica Ferretti and Xiaowen Chen. Xiaowen's here. Where are you? Because I'll need you later. Yes, thank you. All right. So uh, let's start with a movie. So these are flogs. Bill showed them yesterday. These are flogs of starlings. They move collectively. They do this actually in the same way that you move into this room, it gets cold at night and they want to, well, the other way, I guess, then you move into this room. It gets cold at night in the mountains, they come down to roost. So here, if you remember Massimo's talk about gliders going down, similar things happen, but they move in a collective way. And so people have been interested in how they move in a collective way, but also the sort of what this is, is this is a prototypical example of an active matter system. That's how it's presented, that it's interesting to study collective active matter because we can learn some new non-equilibrium physics, right? A lot of people do that. And so we ask the question, well, can we learn some new non-equilibrium physics? Basically, we ask whether the system is out of equilibrium. And we did this a while back. So I won't go into the details, but we built a dynamical inference model uh, on trajectories, we actually took trajectories, we considered them as dynamical, dynamical objects, and on short time scales, we built a, an, we, we did direct inference, so sort of for option two in, in Gaspers talk right, directly from data. And the model has two main time scales. So one is a relaxation time scale, which is basically how fast the birds align with the neighborhood, right? The, the model assumes that the birds want to be aligned, so they reorientate, and that's a relaxation time scale. And there's another time scale, the network time scale, which, why didn't that work? Oh, no. Oh, there you go. Sorry, uh, okay, let me go back. Yeah, okay, now I understand why it didn't work. Right, so this is basically, the, the model is that the birds have an orientation, they wanna align and they listen to their neighbors, defined in some way, and they reorient and there's some noise to it and that basically sets the interaction range and C and the uh, interaction parameter J. And there's a second time scale, which is the network orientation time scale, which is how fast the net, basically what is this neighborhood for the birds reorientates. And that we can calculate directly from data is basically the correlation time scale of how the network rearranges. And so as I said, we did this inference, I won't go into uh, the details, but what we find is that there's a separation of time scales, meaning that on the time scale on which the network rearranges, which is much longer than the time scales on which the birds align, the birds manage to align. So basically they feel a fixed network and on this time scale they manage to be perfectly aligned and the network changes slowly and they always manage to align. So basically, the network evolves adiabatically and we're in quasi-equilibrium. Oops, right? Bummer. This was supposed to be a non, this was supposed to be a out of equilibrium system. And so what this shows that motion alone is not enough to be for the statistics of the system to be described out of equilibrium. Don't get me wrong, of course the birds eat, breathe, and all that and consume energy, but for describing this collective motion. Uh, that's, you know, we, we, uh, an equilibrium theory does good, does fairly well. So this motivated us to ask the question, well, if we look at these collective systems, and, you know, birds are one example, but there's epithelial cells, the sheep, there's fish, bacteria, how can we look for out of equilibrium signatures? Okay, so I told everybody I'll be playing movies, so that's what I'll be doing. Uh, and intuitively, we know what out of equilibrium means. Out of equilibrium means that if we play the movie forward and we play the movie backward, they'll look different, right? So I'm playing two movies. One of them is forward, one of them is backward. Any guesses? I wouldn't guess. I didn't guess. 
I can just tell you that for real one, this is backwards, this is forwards, okay? But you can't tell. This is, a, again, this is the same model of the birds aligning and doing what we want them to do, right? It's just, you know, the birds are, uh, are pixels and so on. Anyway, you get the idea. But intuitively, we know what non-equilibrium means, and we can turn this intuition into measures, which people have done, which basically, if you consider the forward trajectories, and then you do a time reversal and consider backward trajectories, you see how different are the statistics of the forward trajectories compared to the statistics of backward trajectories. And this defines uh, an entropy term, and if you then look at the long time limit and define by time, you get what's called the entropy production rate. And the entropy production rate is a measure of how far from equilibrium you are because basically it just measures how different the statistics of the forward and backward trajectories are. So we asked, can we take this seriously and apply it to data? Okay, I won't get to data, so don't get your hopes up, but this, is, this was our goal. Basically, can we, you know, I mean, if we look at this data, we should be able to calculate this. Of course, that's in theory, because in practice, you need to consider all forward and all backward trajectories, if you start from uh, the definition. So, but we, we set about this, basically taking a microscopic agent-based model of these birds, which is the thing I showed you on the first slide, where the birds want to align, and so on. So this is how it looks like in detail. As I said, it has two components. It has the orientation of the birds, which is set by, well, them basically wanting to orient, and this is just the polar orientation term, so they have, all they have is direction and they want to reorient with respect to the neighbors. There's noise on top of that, and on top of that, birds move, which is what makes it active, okay? So there's only two components to this, to this model. It's very simple. Birds want to be aligned and birds move. Nothing else, and there's noise. And now we're going to apply time reversal parity to trajectories and ask what happens. And so we can turn the crank and we can actually calculate for this specific model the value of the, the, the an equation for the entropy production rate, which I'm showing to you not to torture you in the afternoon, but because you see that it's basically proportional to this DNDT term, which tells us how fast the network reorients. It's also, this whole thing is equal to the work of a fictitious external protocol that rewires precisely this adjacency matrix. Because there's nowhere else that the non-equilibrium thing can come from. So we consider the specific type of these models where the interaction is metric. We also consider topological for the aficionados, but I won't go into... Uh, I, I don't have time for that, basically. So for the metric one is that basically the interaction matrix is that birds interact within only birds that are within a given distance of each other in measured in meters, in physical distance. And so we have this interaction matrix. And for this model, so this is this polar active matter, a model, you have a phase separation from a random system to a locally ordered and coordinated system. And so you have the polar order parameter. This is the phase transition so as a function of density and temperature, which is basically the noise. So remember that my equations had, well, the Langevin equations, they had a noise term. And if you look at the entropy production as a function of these two same two parameters, the entropy production is zero only at the phase transition. So what's going on? Well, basically, let's think about the simple regimes. First of all, there's the zero temperature regime, and basically, there nobody moves. So if nobody moves, then we understand why there's no entropy production. Right? Then there's the other regime where everybody moves, but everybody moves chaotically, randomly. Well, not chaotically, I'm in a physics place, so I shouldn't say that. Uh, randomly, uh, and you know, so it's like a gas. So also no entropy production there because there are no interactions. And you only get interactions at this phase tr transition because that's where they are somewhat ordered but still listening to what's going on around them. So you basically have coupling of motion and interactions. And those you need the coupling of the two to get to, to be out of equilibrium to see entropy production, okay? And in the previous system, we were not, you know, 
we were probably a little bit more in the audit phase uh, uh, than that. But we don't, you know, we don't know. This is something that we should do. Um, but so th that that's numerical results. But we sort of wanted to understand where this comes from. Okay, and this is really bad because it's not projecting one color. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not projecting. Okay, so here there's a circle. Okay, this is the interaction radius. And basically, what this formula tells us for entropy production is that if we consider the forward case and we have type diverging trajectories, if we time reverse it, we have converging trajectories. And if we are to be in equilibrium, that means that the statistics of such trajectories and the statistics of such trajectories or the probability of such trajectories and such has to be exactly equal. Okay, and if they're not, then you're going to produce entropy. And so we asked ourselves, is there an easier way than measuring the probability distribution of the trajectories to find whether we're in the case that this and this is equally likely? And the answer is yes. All that you have to do is you have to look at the asymmetric steady state, sorry, at the steady state distribution uh, of the system. In this case, you look at the distribution of particles at the given distance. And if it's asymmetric, so here it's as a function of angles that we parameterize the system by the main angle of the flight and then the relative angle. Uh, base, but basically, if this distribution is asymmetric, then you get entropy production, and if you don't, then you don't. And this comes from this again. So this, th this is basically showing this intuition about well, how like whether the two paths are equally probable. And since it is late, I will torture you a little bit because I think you would enjoy it otherwise. So I'll show you basically where this comes from. So we have this entropy production rate with the network rearrangement term and the directionality term, which we can in steady state massage into this form where this network rearrangement basically becomes, becomes this uh, term and we're averaging over positions. And this position, this averaging is what gives us this factor related to the distribution uh, of particle pairs and we have a simple geometric factor. So we multiply these two, which encodes the asymmetry, and as long as there's any asymmetry in that, it gets amplified by this geometric factor. So basically, as I said, it's the coupling of the motion with the interactions that is important, but at the end of the day, you have a simple prescription of finding out how out of equilibrium your system is, and this is true you know, this specific derivation here is for this system, but it holds true more generally. Okay, and, okay, coupling of motion and interactions. And this project was actually started during a summer school that Thierry uh, Mora, Ilya Nemenman and myself uh, organized in Boulder a few years back, and we're doing something similar next year. So, Advertisement, if you're interested in going to Lazouche for a month next summer, we're organizing a biophysics summer school, which should be fun. All right, so when I give talks about birds, uh, you know, I usually give some sort of more results about why they actually uh, fly together and so on, and then people start asking me questions about bird psychology, right? I don't know, do I look like a bird psychologist? Uh, so, I, I actually met a psychologist, uh, Evelina Knavska, who's at the Nensky Institute in, in, in Warsaw, and uh, this made me think whether we can, instead of studying systems like birds, where we ask what's at the origin of global order, can we actually study, can we apply can we think about more complex systems, such as mice, a community of mice, with similar approaches? So what Evelina has is she has this amazing system of uh, basically burrows and tunnels and mice that run around them. So it's called the Eco Hub, because it's a natural environment uh, for mice. So it's, they, they ran around it. It's basically a, a controlled environment. So it's the kind of thing they like. So they feel happy. They, 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 uh, they live here. But they, all, they also have chips inserted into them. And there's antennas. So they have ra radio transmit their position. 
So we know exactly where they are as a function of time. And so, of course, they're much more complicated. They have, you know, I don't know, they, you know, there's heterogeneity in them. But we, you know, how far can we go with these overly simplistic explanation, uh, descriptions, and also can we actually figure out what's the probability of individual animals versus emergent behavior that comes from interactions. Okay, so here's the movie again, because it's late and I know we like movies. This is basically as good as Top Gun. That's maybe a statement about Top Gun. Here you see Maverick's butt gets stuck. <laughs> it's great fun to watch. All right, so. We first looked at the data, and we looked at the, what did we look at? Uh, the pairwise correlation function, basically how likely are two mice to be in the same box. This is the data, then we shuffled it in various ways to basically show that there are interactions in the system. We also looked at the correlation of the number of mice to be in a specific box as a function of time, and you see that it has this strong plateau, again, compared to the shuffled data at long time. So basically, they, like, you know, they, they, they do like to be together in some box, and so the, another signature of interactions. But maybe the most interesting thing is if you look the, at the waiting time distribution to leave a box, and you see that it has these low, long tails. So that tells us that there's a broad range of time scales involved in these interactions. Now, can we learn the interaction rules for such a system? So the first thing we did is we Learned the, we looked at the statics and we learned a static, well, we learned a steady state distribution. So we used the maximum entropy approach. Uh, so we constrained the pairwise correlation functions that two mice are in, in the same box without specifying the box. So the thing I showed you on the previous slide. And, uh, you know, so we basically constrain the pairwise interactions, which also automatically constrains the field. Uh, so this shows that you can learn these interactions, that you can predict higher order moments, and you can even predict things like which two mice like to be in which specific boxes. So you can predict things you don't put in. It works, and if you look at the statistics, uh, you actually find that the actual values of their interactions are really not very stable, not reproducible, but the statistics are. So that gives us some feeling that we are capturing something, so the mean and the standard deviation doesn't change, and on top of that, the statistics are consistent ex against across experiments. So we have some reproducibility. However, we're interested in dynamic properties here, so then we looked at transition probabilities. So we took this steady state model and we calculated, uh, well, we, we took the data first of all, and we normalized it by the mouse identity and going from box alpha to beta, and it turns out that if we do that, then the transition probabilities between boxes collapse. And so if we assume detailed balance now, uh, we can ask whether we can reproduce it with some sort of dynamical model. So we considered Glauber dynamics and Metropolis uh, dynamics, and this is this is Metropolis in, in yellow and Glauber in red here, and this is the data, and you see that we can actually reproduce it with uh, Glauber dynamics. Okay, so we're nearly home, right? So we now know we have Glauber dynamics, but then we looked at our waiting time distribution and things fail dramatically. So these are different. Uh, mice, this is the data is solid, and the dashed lines are what we get from a Glauber dynamics with the interactions from the static model. It falls off much, much more quickly. We don't get these long tails, we don't get this broad distribution of time scales. And when we look at the escape triggered average, so basically how long do you wait between the mouse tries to move again, you clearly see that there's memory in the dynamics. So as you uh, get further away, the, ma the, the mouse is uh, less likely. Uh, that the time to the last escape uh, increases. Okay, so we need memory. And so how do we put in memory into models in physics? Well, if we think about, uh, you know, like Langevin systems, where if you have a memory kernel, this is basically because you're not observing some other degrees of freedom and you integrate out these other degrees of freedom, you'll get a memory kernel. So we took the same intuition here, and uh, we basically asked, well, if we couple our mouse now 
to an oscillator bath to basically external degrees of freedom, uh, can we write down the dynamics in such a way that we have dynamics that is consistent with the statics? That's our goal, okay? So you may be surprised to learn that there's actually no recipe for writing down a dynamical model that is automatically consistent with either an equilibrium model or a static model, a steady state distribution model. We don't have a way of doing that. So that's what we did here. That's the whole goal of it, okay? And so we take our mouse and we couple it to external degrees of freedom, which we can model as oscillators, and then we integrate out these oscillators. And we find an effective transition probability, so this is again on the Glauber example, you can do it in other ways, but you now know why I'm looking at Glauber. And the effective field has the static local field put in, it has a memory term with a very concrete prescription, and it has colored noise whose correlator is given by this kernel of the memory. And it's a very, it's a one prescription, there's no other way, okay? That's the, that's the thing. And if you want to know how this works, well, that was on Shawan's post. Okay, so we apply it to mice. So again, we learned the statics like we did before. We parameterize the memory kernel to make our life slightly easier. And then uh, following this prescription, we fit the... Uh, well, we, we, we learn the, the, the effective fields from the waiting time distribution and we are able to learn such parameters that reproduce the waiting time distribution and that get back the transition, the, but still have the right steady state properties. So we now have a dynamical model, one concrete dynamical model with parameters that reproduces the steady state distribution. And um, so what do we do with it? So one thing we look is, well, as we said, you know, is there collective dynamics in the system? Do the mice care about each other? So I sort of showed you they do, but this is another signature of how they do, and something the model allows us to learn is following dynamics. So if the red mouse moves to another box, will the green mouse follow? And it does, and there's a characteristic time scales between one and two minutes, depending on experiment and mice, that they follow each other. So this is a relatively short time scales in the system. So they really do seem to follow each other in the way we understand following. And then maybe back to our psychologist and neuroscientist friends, why do they care about this? Why did they build this ecological system? So one thing they did is they want to understand how social interactions between mice uh, can be altered in various uh, situations. And what they did is they administered a drug that makes the mice socially impaired. But the drug lasts for about five days, and within these five days it sort of then goes away. So we can actually, with our model and our approach, we can see uh, a change in the interaction structure after the drug is administered compared, and again, the colors don't show up about where, when, when, the, when the drug is. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, compared to, to after when the, the drug weans off. So basically, the interaction is stronger before the drug then uh, is increased the, sorry, the standard, the, 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 the variance of the interactions is increased when the drug is administered compared to when it's not and compared to uh, when it goes away. And so we looked at it a little bit further and we found that, so it's not actually the, the range of, it's, sorry, it's not the value of the interactions that changes, it's really the standard deviation within the mouse horde and what happens is that the mice still have preferences for different mice. It's just they're not able to communicate these preferences. So we measured the level of frustration as a function of day, and we see that within these five days when the drug is administered, they're basically much more frustrated than later when the drug stops working or when the drug doesn't work. So what it shows you is that how well, so in a, you know, in a way, it's not like the mice are, so they're socially impaired, but they're not autistic. They're just, I mean, they want to interact, but they're not able to communicate the interaction. All right, so that's it. 
uh, I basically try to show you how we can find simpler ways of measuring whether how irreversible a given system is, uh, just by looking stead at steady state distributions. And then what, since we're really interested in learning dynamics of these collective systems, we encountered this problem of actually how do you learn dynamics of an interacting systems, which learned us to find that socially met mice basically get stuck in their interactions. So that's it. <laughs>